Good morning, everyone. This morning, we are focusing on Ezekiel chapters 25 to 32. And the themes that uh, this section speaks about are the same as uh, the themes that we've been hearing about over the last couple of weeks, namely the themes of sin and judgment. But there is uh, one key difference between what we're focusing on today in chapters 25 to 32 compared to the last couple of weeks. You see, over the last couple of weeks, what we've been focusing on in particular is the sin of God's people, that is the people of Jerusalem, of Judah, of Israel, and the judgment that would befall them as a result of that sin, namely the destruction of Jerusalem in 587-86 BC. Today, however, in chapters 25 to 32, we are focusing on the sin of the nations that surrounded uh, the people of Israel and the judgment that would come upon them as a result. Now, friends, as we look at uh, chapter 25, verses 32, uh, we are given some very, very uh, important lessons about the results of God's judgment. And they are lessons that we need to take heed of because, as I've been saying over recent weeks, we will all face God's judgment on the final day. And one thing that we know about God is that he does not change. And so the way in which he goes about judgment in the book of Ezekiel is the same as he will go about judgment when we will all face him on the final day. And the results of God's judgment in the book of Ezekiel will be the same as the results of God's judgment on the final day. And there are four particular results of God's judgment that we learn about from Ezekiel 25 to 32. And the first of these is this, that God's judgment results in punishment for those who are against his people. Ezekiel 28 verse 24 says, No longer will the people of Israel have malicious neighbours who are painful briars and sharp thorns. So the impression that this verse gives us is that around the people of Israel were hostile neighbours, uh, neighbours seeking to act maliciously against the people of Israel. And what we see is that the people of Israel are God's people and he will act against those who are malicious towards his people. Now that might surprise you in the context of Ezekiel given that God was actually punishing uh, the people of Israel, threatening punishment against them and eventually bringing it about with the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and you might think, why is God so concerned about the neighbours of uh, Israel being malicious to them when he's actually punishing them? Well, let me try and illustrate that with a, uh, an imaginative kind of uh, scenario. So imagine that one of my children was being very, very poorly behaved and was deserving of punishment from me. And so uh, I, I'm in the process of disciplining them, of punishing them, when I discover that someone is acting very maliciously towards that child. Now, friends, I will defend my child against such a malicious attack, even though they've done wrong, even though I'm punishing them, but because they are my child, I will defend them from those who act maliciously against them. And that's exactly what is going on here. And as we look at uh, chapter 25, verse 1 and following, we see God pronounce a series of judgments upon the neighbours of Israel because of their malicious acts. Let me summarise uh, what we find in these chapters. So first of all, we see that God would punish the Ammonites for their vengeful delight in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So we read about that in verses 1 through to 7. Now, the Ammonites were descended from Lot, uh, the nephew of Abraham. So there's a sort of a, you know, go back on the family tree and there's connections between uh, the Israelites and the Ammonites, but they were enemies. And it seems that when the Babylonians did conquer Jerusalem, that these people were cheering. They were celebrating. They were celebrating the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the temple. And such malicious delight, vengeful delight on their part was something that did not impress God at all. And as a result, God would 
bring about punishment against them. Uh, secondly, we see that how God would punish the Moabites for their vengeful delight in Judah's humiliation. And we see that in chapter 25, verses 8 to 11. Uh, Moab, like the Ammonites, were descendants of Lot. So again, there's go back in the family trees, there's connections between them and the people of Israel, but they were enemies. And when uh, the people of Judah, that is the southern tribe of uh, Israel, were brought down with the destruction of Jerusalem, well, the Moabites, they rejoiced. Uh, and it seems that the Moabites didn't like the way that the Israelites, uh, the people of Judah, thought that they were special because they were God's people. And so they rejoiced in their downfall and they thought, they're not special anymore, they're just like all of us. And so that kind of uh, vengeful delight, that malicious kind of delight, again, uh, attracted God's attention and he would bring punishment uh, against uh, these people, the Moabites, for being malicious towards his people. We see that uh, God would punish the Edomites and Philistines for their seeking revenge when Jerusalem was down and out. Uh, we see that in chapter 25, verses 12 to 17. The Edomites uh, were descended from Esau, the brother of Jacob, the forefather of Israel. And so again, there's family tree connections there, but again, they were enemies. And it seems that when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, that uh, the Edomites and the Philistines, who are longtime enemies of Israel, used that as an opportunity to kind of really kick them while they were down, uh, to take more action against them, if you like in the time when they were really down and out. And God noticed that and he would take action against that and punish them. We also see that God would punish the Phoenicians for delighting in opportunities to prosper because of Jerusalem's destruction. Uh, indeed, chapters 26 to 28 uh, speak about that in great detail. But uh, friends, the Phoenicians were the people of Tyre and Sidon to the northwest of the people of Israel. And Tyre was a very prosperous city uh, and its uh, prosperity was built on trade. But the people of uh, Judah, the people of Israel, were a bit of an annoyance uh, to the people of Tyre because their control of uh, the land of uh, Israel really sort of got in the way of uh, Tyre's attempts to trade with the people of Egypt. But with the people of uh, Israel gone, that would open up further trade for Tyre. And so Tyre was very, very thrilled uh, to see the people of Israel done away with because it would open up that trade route and make them even richer. And God sees this malicious delight, uh, you know, trying to get rich at the expense of the demise of his people. And so he will act uh, against the Phoenicians. Uh, we also see that God would punish the Egyptians for letting his people down. Chapters 29, uh, really through 32, focus on Egypt and how God would act against Egypt in judgment. But one of the things that's highlighted is the fact that when the Israelites sinfully relied upon the people of Egypt for protection, that the Egyptians would let them down and cause harm to the Israelites as a result. It could be that they promised to help, but never really intended with going through. And even though it was wrong for the Israelites uh, to depend upon Egypt for help, God would bring punishment against the Egyptians for maliciously failing uh, the people of Israel uh, when they depended upon them. Now, friends, all these things have in common the way in which God will bring punishment against those who act maliciously against his people. And as we look at the New Testament, we see that God's judgment on the final day will do exactly the same thing. Uh, we will see that God will punish those who bring trouble to Jesus' followers. So have a look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-7. We read, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. On the final day, when the Lord Jesus returns to judge, he will punish those who act maliciously against his people. 
the Thessalonians, who are being written to here, well, they were people who were suffering persecution because of their commitment to follow Jesus. And the Apostle Paul assures them that on the final day, that those who have troubled them, that those who have persecuted them, those who have acted maliciously against them, will be punished by the Lord Jesus when he returns. And so for us, friends, as we think about the judgment to come, the big lesson is this, don't act maliciously against God's people. Don't act maliciously against those who are followers of Jesus because God cares for his people and will bring punishment against those who act against his people. And so really, the best thing you can do is not only not to act maliciously against the people of God, but actually to join the people of God by becoming a follower of Jesus. For that is the only way to be spared punishment on the final day. And friends, if you have acted maliciously against the people of God in the past, then see from the example of the Apostle Paul who wrote to Thessalonians, who was a great persecutor of Christians before he came to faith, that even persecutors of Christians can be forgiven of their sins and become a part of the people of God and be spared the punishment that we all deserve on the final day. So the first thing that we read about is that God's judgment results in punishment for those who are against his people. So don't act against his people, rather become a part of his people. Now, the second lesson that uh, emerges about God's judgment in Ezekiel 25 to 32 is that God's judgment results in punishment for those who are proud. God's judgment results in punishment for those who are proud. And in Ezekiel 25 to 32, uh, we are given two examples of pride that will lead to punishment as a result of God's judgment. And the first of these examples is the pride of the king of Tyre. Look at uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 2. Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a man and not a God, though you think you are as wise as a God. Uh, the king of Tyre thinks that he is godlike. Uh, why? Well, remember that Tyre was a very, very prosperous city built on trade. And uh, the king of Tyre who rules over that is no doubt very wealthy and very powerful as a result. And one of the things that happens, friends, to people who have power, to people who have great wealth, is that they think more highly of themselves than they ought. And in the case of the king of Tyre, he thought he was responsible for all of his prosperity and wealth. But actually it all came from God and he failed to thank God. And because the king of Tyre thought himself godlike, God would act against him in judgment. We read about this in verses 6 to 7. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you think you are wise, as wise as a God, I am going to bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of nations. They will draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. So because of this pride, not just because of their malicious actions against the people of Israel, but also because of the pride of the king of Tyre, God would bring judgment against Tyre, punishment against Tyre, destruction against Tyre. Now the second example of pride that we see in Ezekiel 25 to 32 is the pride of the king of Egypt. We read about this in verses uh, 2 to 3 of Ezekiel 29. Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak to him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, you great monster lying among your streams. You say, the Nile is mine. I made it for myself. Uh, Egypt, like Tyre, was very prosperous and the king of Egypt, uh, very wealthy and very powerful as a result. And it seems that Egypt's prosperity was built upon the irrigation made possible 
by the river Nile. But notice who's taking credit for all of this. The king of Egypt claims to be the one uh, who really makes the river Nile do what it does, who actually created it. He claims that which is actually God's true claim. God is the creator and the sustainer of all things. And rather than giving thanks to God for the prosperity that the river Nile brings, the king of Egypt takes all the credit for himself in his pride. And as a result, God would bring judgment. Verses 9 to 10 of chapter 29. Egypt will become a desolate wasteland. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Because you said the Nile is mine, I made it. Therefore, I am against you and against your streams. And I will make the land of Egypt a ruin and a desolate waste from Migdol to Aswan as far as the border of Cush. Egypt would come under judgment because of the pride of the king of Egypt. Not just their malicious actions against the Israelites, but also because of this pride. And indeed, when you look at the scriptures, friends, uh, what James 4 and 1 Peter 5 say, quoting from the book of Proverbs, is true. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Anyone who stands up in pride against God will be brought low by his judgment. But those who humble themselves before God, who recognise their sinfulness before God and ask for help for eternal life and forgiveness through Jesus, well, God will not oppose such people on the day of judgment. But those who are proud, those who take credit for what God uh, has done, they will be brought low. Those who think themselves godlike will be brought low. And indeed, those who think they can be right with God because of how good they are, which is really another form of pride, they too will be brought low. Friends, if you want to be ready for the judgment to come, don't be proud. Be humble. Humble yourself before God. Humbly accept all that he has done for you through Jesus and you will be spared the punishment that will come to the proud. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Can I say, friends, we must get rid of the word uh, pride from our vocabulary as Christians. I remember a former principal of Sydney Missionary and Bible College where I used to work talking to me about a conversation that his mother had had with a friend. And uh, the mother uh, was talking to this friend. The friend said, gee, you must be proud of your son uh, given that he's the principal of that Bible college. And uh, the principal's mother said, I'm not proud, I am thankful. And friends, we must never be proud. We must always be thankful for what God has done. Uh, there's the old saying that you take pride in your work. Well, friends, it's good to do things well out of love for others and in service of others and to honour God, not so that we can pat ourselves on the shoulder. Friends, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself before him if you wish to be ready uh, for the day of judgment and to escape the punishment that comes with it. Third lesson about God's judgment from Ezekiel 25 to 32 is this. God's judgment results in the removal of temptations for his people. So in Ezekiel 29 verses 14 to 16, we read these words. I will bring them back from captivity and return them to Upper Egypt, the land of their ancestry. There they will be a lowly kingdom. It will be the lowliest of kingdoms and will never again exalt itself above the other nations. I will make it so weak that it will never again rule over the nations. Egypt will no longer be a source of confidence for the people of Israel, but will be a reminder of their sin in turning to her for help. Then they will know that I am the sovereign Lord. Uh, friends, this is talking about the judgment that would come upon Egypt. Uh, she would go into captivity for a time, but would come back, but would never be the same again. Uh, Egypt would be a very lowly kingdom. Uh, it would never be the leader of other nations again. Notice the reason why God does this though so that Egypt will no longer be a source of confidence for his people. 
Remember, one of the great temptations that the, the Israelites succumbed to was to rely upon foreign nations like Egypt for protection instead of God. But when the people of Israel come back to the land, not only would they have neighbours dealt with who were malicious towards them, not only would they have peace, but they would also be free of temptation to rely upon others and to sin. Now, friends, ultimately, I think all of this is fulfilled uh, in what's to come in the new Jerusalem. But notice this idea that with God's judgment comes the removal of temptation for his people. One of the things that is God's people saved by Jesus that we look forward to with the coming judgment is being transformed, transformed into people who are no longer sinful. And because we will no longer be sinful, we will no longer be tempted. Now, I'm sure that for many of you, temptation is a source of great anxiety, a source of great stress. Uh, it's hard, isn't it? We want to do the right thing. But uh, what we are being tempted by is so alluring, and, and there's this great inner battle. But that inner battle will be no more, friends, once God's judgment happens. Once God's judgment happens, all the things that might tempt us as God's people will be removed. And we should give thanks and praise to God for that. And in the meantime, try and stand firm uh, in the midst of temptations that come our way. Now, the final lesson about God's judgment that Ezekiel 25 to 32 teaches us is this, that God's judgment results in him being seen to be the one true God who rules over all. Now, there is a, a constant refrain uh, that we see through this section of Ezekiel, uh, which speaks about why God brings about judgment. And it goes like this, uh, then you will know that I am the Lord, or then they will know that I am the Lord, or then they will know that I am the sovereign Lord. Uh, the, the point is that God's judgment will make it very clear to all who the one true God is. Again, I said this uh, saying or variations of that saying are prominent through this section. Have a look at where, where, where it appears. Chapters 25, verses 5, 7, 11, 17. Chapter 26, verse 6. Chapter 28, verses 22, 23, 24, and 26. Chapter 29, verses 6, 9, 16, 21. Chapter 30, verse 8. Uh, verse 19, 25, and 26, and chapter 32, verse 15. Uh, this makes it very clear, friends, that one of the, the key purposes of God's judgment is that people know that he is the one true God who rules over all. Uh, friends, an example of uh, this saying is that I want to draw your attention to is Ezekiel 28, verses 25 to 26. We read, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When I gather the people of Israel from the nations where they have been scattered, I will show myself holy among them in the sight of the nations. Then they will live in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live there in safety and will build houses and plant vineyards. They will live in safety when I inflict punishment on all their neighbours who malign them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. You see, as... God brings judgment upon the nations, which results in deliverance for his people, peace for his people, a lack of temptation for his people. Then his people will know that there is only one God, the God of Israel. As God brings judgment upon the nations around Israel, they will know that there is only one true God, the God of Israel. And friends, the book of Philippians tells us about how the judgment to come is the same. It will be a time when everyone will know that there is one true God. Uh, have a listen to Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, uh, Jesus is God. He reveals God the Father to the world. 
when he was raised from the dead, God gave him the name above every name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And he is the one before whom every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Every knee will bow before him. And that will happen on the day of judgment, friends. On the day of judgment, when Jesus returns in blazing fire, every knee will bow before him. Every tongue will acknowledge that he is Lord, that there is no other. But friends, on that day, there are going to be two groups of people. There are going to be a group of people who are bowed down before Jesus and who are acknowledging that he is Lord with great joy. But then there are going to be a bunch of people who will be bowing down and acknowledging that Jesus is Lord with a profound sense of regret, of grief, of despair, of dread. And those people will be the people who have not acknowledged Jesus as Lord now. You see, the truth of the matter, friends, is that all of us will face Jesus on the final day. All of us will see the truth of who Jesus is when the time of judgment comes. All of us will see that there is only one God and he is known through Jesus. The question is, which group will you be a part of? The group that rejoices at the knowledge that there is only one God made known through Jesus or the group that despairs because you have failed to acknowledge Jesus, failed to bow down to him now and to confess that he is Lord now. Friends, it's not too late to change. Uh, indeed, the reason why Jesus hasn't returned yet is so people can uh, turn back to God, can humble themselves before Jesus. And I want to say to you, if you're unsure about who Jesus is, it's really worth taking the time now to check it out. Because much better to check it out now than to be found on the final day ignorant of the truth, in fact, defiant of the truth, and under God's punishment as a result. I'm very happy uh, to meet with people, to talk with them about Jesus, to help them to understand who Jesus is and why we need to turn to him now. Because the truth of the matter is, friends, God's judgment causes people to know that there is only one true God, and that's Jesus. Will you be ready to meet him on that day? So, it's, again, it's important for us uh, to look at books like the book of Ezekiel that talk about the judgment of God because God doesn't change and the judgment that he carries out in the book of Ezekiel is the same as what he will do on the final day. Uh, God will punish those who act maliciously against his people. So don't do that. Be a part of his people. God will punish those who are proud. So don't be proud. Humble yourself and accept Jesus and forgiveness of sins through him. God will remove temptation from his people. Oh, I rejoice at that hope. Uh, keep looking forward to that and living in light of that. And as we just heard, God will show to all through judgment that he is the one true God who rules over all. Are you ready to meet him? Friends, those who humble themselves and accept Jesus now will be accepted by Jesus on that day. Those who reject Jesus now will be rejected by Jesus on that day. Turn to him now while there is still time. Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that all who hear these words today uh, would indeed humble themselves before the Lord Jesus, find forgiveness and life in him, be filled with hope and live wholeheartedly for him as we wait for the time of judgment to come. Amen.